And good morning. Welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Today, it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce Sherry Turkle. Dr. Turkle is professor of the Social Studies of Science and Technology at MIT. She's a sociologist and clinical psychologist, a leading media scholar who spent the last three decades studying our relationship with the digital culture we've created. Her classic studies in the field are the second self, life on the screen, and alone together. She joins us today to discuss her latest book, Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age. Emphasis here on the power, I found this book an eloquent, profound, and often moving examination of the consequences of our addiction to our devices for ourselves and our families, and how conversation, which we may dimly recall as an interaction between two or more humans in which no devices are involved, can help. Please join me in welcoming Sherry Turkle. Well, that was a lovely introduction, and what was loveliest about it is that I think it it touches on the fact that this really is a book of my heart. Um, the other books I've written, and I, I'm dedicated to all of them, all books like your children, um, basically came out of my doing, sponsored by the NSF or you know, kind of other funders, 10, 15 years of work, 5, 10, 15 years of work, and then reporting out on what I had found. And this book began in a somewhat different way. The End of Alone Together, which was a book about a kind of new social situation that people found themselves in. We, we'd all be here, uh, so we were together. We were in a social situation of some sort. But um, we often found ourselves feeling um, uh, that we could find a sort of place alone in our heads in a new kind of way, because we could go to our phones and be in a different kind of space, or flip it, uh, we would be alone in our apartments or in a, in a park or wherever, but we would feel ourselves more together with the world, with our communities. I mean, a, a new kind of global together that that was absolutely unprecedented. So that was the, the topic of that book, really was what was the psychology, what were the new political dynamics, what was the feeling of that new state. Um, at the end of that book, as I listened to the transcripts and gone over the hundreds and hundreds of transcripts, particularly from young people, but not just from young people. One phrase kept coming up, something that I really hadn't had a chance to explore in that book, which was, I'd rather text than talk. As part of the kind of situation of people who now had the devices that enabled this alone together state, these new always on, always on new technologies that enabled this new thing I was studying. And I'm a psychologist, and um, I'm psychodynamically trained, <clears throat> which means that I'm interested in sort of interpersonal dynamics, the importance of early childhood, the importance of communication and connection in early childhood, the importance of empathy and its development in early childhood. Um, and I thought to myself, OK, let's take seriously you know, instead of taking this as a litany or a catchphrase, let's really take seriously if people tell me they'd rather text than talk, if they're really doing that, let me explore this like an ethnographer, let me follow this story in business, in romance, in the raising of children, and how people are getting along in their communities and their, with their colleagues, with their lovers, with their families, with their friends. Let me follow the story, and what will that mean in all of these areas of life? And so that's how I'm trained. I'm trained to be an ethnographer. And essentially, that's what reclaiming conversation is. It's a look at, for me, a much broader sweep of data, because I did go into law firms and doctor's offices, you know, the kinds of doctor's offices where literally doctors are looking at screens instead of talking to patients, because they're forced to two law firms where people felt it was more important to stay at their screens than go to lunch with their colleagues. Big mistake if you're a lawyer and want to get promoted. Um, big mistake in terms of the culture of those firms, but yet that's how they felt about it. 
software companies where people had the right kind of cafeterias and micro kitchens to sit down and have a conversation, except the highest value of the company was that they'd be always on the messaging system in order to show their devotion. So I went to all kinds of places, as I say, a much broader sweep of the world, and I studied this issue of conversation. So what did I find? Well, maybe it makes sense to say what I find by starting with a story, which is not a feel-good story for me. At the end of the book was published, and I was just waiting for it to come out. Before it comes out, a New York Times reporter calls me. Um, my publisher hadn't wanted me talking, you know, talking much before the book comes out. This is such a, an event. And um, the New York Times reporter calls me, and he wants me to, now I'm finally allowed to talk about the book, he wants me to comment on a story he's writing about Hello Barbie. So Hello Barbie is a robot doll that comes out of the box and says, Hello, I'm Barbie. I think I love you. I have a sister. I don't like her so much. I think I'm jealous of her. I hear you have a sister. Are you jealous of your sister? Let's talk. In other words, it comes out of the box with a pretend empathy narrative and starts to try to engage you in conversation about this pretend empathy narrative with the idea that that will be this, this pretend best friend thing that will be conversation. So my position on this, you know, everything I know about kids growing up and from studying sociable robotics and how kids respond to it, is that you can get a kid to talk to a robot that offers pretend empathy, but you can't get a child to learn and experience empathy from a robot that has none to give because this robot hasn't known a life, it doesn't have a sister, it doesn't know what jealousy is. In other words, this is not, this conversation is not going to do the job that conversation needs to do. So it turns out, after you know, studying law offices and business offices and you know, families. Now there is another part of the story, in fact, too, which in fact I do end the book on the issue of robotics, but Hello Barbie wasn't on the market. You know, I would have ended the book with Hello Barbie if it had been. It turns out that sociable robotics is also part of this story of kind of a crisis of conversation because we're offering ourselves and our children objects that are a faux conversation. So just to give you some sense of all the ways we can't learn empathy now in our culture, and yet there's an empathy crisis, and I'm going to argue, just to give the argument of, that I'm going to make today and that I make in Reclaiming Conversation, that to this empathy crisis, conversation is the remedy, and to make a bad pun, I call it the talking cure, and that, in fact, is where the book began, with a 40% drop in all markers for empathy among college students. It was a meta-analysis that looked at many surveys, many studies over the past 20 years. There's this 40% drop among college students in many markers for empathy, most of it in the past 10 years. And I, in, in, in our um, conversation, uh, because I'm only gonna talk for about half my time, um, it's telling that the very brilliant woman who was the head of this study, after learning this, decided to write empathy apps for the iPhone. So the whole question of let us grant that part of the way we got ourselves into some trouble with empathy, which is born from looking at someone in the eye not breaking that contact, hearing what they have to say, they're hearing back what you have to say, taking some time, let us grant that interrupting that by going like this is part of the problem. To what degree do we want to solve it with this technology that we have always on hand? How much are we going to look to technology to solve the problem that 
perhaps technology got us into. It obviously is very seductive to do that, but is that a good idea? So I found out that um, I began to get more evidence about the, the, empathy, uh, the empathy crisis when I was called in to consult uh, in middle schools for uh, much younger students than college students. Um, and in one school in particular in the book, I call it the Holbrook School, the teachers were saying that the students, about 12-year-old students, were behaving like eight-year-old students. They were showing a kind of cruelty to their fellow students, not on the internet, I mean, not kind of in cyberbullying situations, but really the teachers were saying they didn't seem to understand how other students were feeling when other students were talking to them. I mean, they essentially were describing a crisis of empathy, and they didn't seem to get it when their teachers spoke to them. They said 12-year-old students behave like 8-year-old students. So it was a very dramatic study for me, all these places where I was finding teachers and um, educators of was a, did a large study of kind of teachers and all kinds of educators in that age range who were all talking about kind of the same thing. But then there were a group of studies that were truly optimistic and that I want to share with you. In only five days without phones in a summer camp that's device free, young people get those empathy markers to come right back up. In other words, we are built to have an empathic response to each other. Now, how do they get those empathy markers to come back up? They talk to each other. They talk to each other without turning away from each other to look for a device. So why would we, you know, getting back to the Barbie and getting back to the fact that most kids have phones when they're five or six or seven, why would we give kids just at the time when they're developing that empathic response, why would we want to give children an object that will block the development of empathy? And phones do block the development of empathy, not because we meant them to. It's not kind of a, it's not because we said, oh, we're going to just, you know, invent something that's really going to get in the way of empathy. It's just because when you go like that to a person, you're putting them on pause and you're saying that you can't attend to what they're thinking or feeling. Now, the more developed and older the person is, you know, the less, let's say, damage it's going to do. But a series of studies show that if you are sitting at a table and you put a phone, a silent phone on the table between you, you will feel less, first of all, the conversation will go to trivial matters. The topic of the conversation will change. It will not be about important things. And secondly, you will feel less empathic connection with the person you're talking to. And then they redid this study in a natural setting where they put the phone not between two people having lunch, but in the periphery of the landscape, kind of like if you put the phone almost where I couldn't see it at the edge of the stage and had me talking to you know somebody at lunch. But the, 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 the phone is almost like at the next table. And they got the same results. Conversation on things less important and less sense of commitment and connection, less empathic sense with the person you're talking with. Essentially, it makes every kind of sense that if people think they're going to be interrupted, their attitude toward a conversation changes. It's really as simple as that. Um, and college students know that. They know that they don't pay attention to each other when they have their phones. And they talk to me about something they call the rule of three, since a lot of my own research took place on college campuses. So one young man says to me, um, introducing the rule of three, because at the beginning I had been thinking of doing a study really on the, um, on the nature of texting, on the diction of texting, really getting deeply into the kind of linguistics of texting. And he said, don't do that. It's not our texting, he says, that's getting us into trouble. It's what our texting is doing to our in-person conversations. And that's really was my lodestar for this study. It's not our texting that's getting us into trouble, he said. It's what our texting is doing 
to our in-person conversations. And I said, well, tell me more. And to illustrate this, I get the story about the rule of three. And here is the rule of three. When you're at dinner, let's say it's six, three people have to have their heads up before you get, give yourself permission to put your head down to text. Because everybody has their phone and everybody's going to be texting at dinner. So the rule of three is a kind of new politeness about when you can let your, your attention go down. So what is the result of the rule of three? It's exactly the result of all those studies that took place with the silent phone on the table that kind of silenced, that changed the nature of discussion and gave people less of an empathic connection with each other. Things are kept light and on subjects where you don't mind being interrupted, and people feel less of an empathic connection with each other. And then, it's not just among college students. I mean, I should mention, a recent Pew study showed that 89% of adults say that in their last social interaction, they took out a phone. And 82% say that it diminished the conversation. Now, that study goes on to be very realistic and very positive and very kind of upbeat about all the great things people did when they took out their phone. They looked up a movie. They, I mean, they, they looked up a cinematographer. They checked a, a thing in their neighborhood. I mean, they, you know, it, the phone is completely integrated in their life. But bottom line, 89% interrupted a social interaction. 82% say it lessened the conversation. Rule of three. And then there's the rule of seven. The rule of seven is what a college junior described as this. It takes seven minutes to know whether a converse, where a conversation is going to go. You have to, just like it probably takes seven minutes to know, like, whether you're going to pay close attention to this. You have to get used to, you know, somebody's body in the room, the way somebody speaks, the kind of cadence how they express themselves, but certainly in a conversation where you're kind of adjusting to each other, there are fits and there are starts, there are lulls, it takes seven minutes to sort of see whether this is going to be worth her time, she explains to me. And then she says, I often don't put in my seven minutes because I just would rather go to the phone and get the reliability of that sort of steady feed. It's easier to just send a text during those seven minutes. It's easier to get something sure and certain, and it's more efficient. And a lot of people I interviewed said that, that they don't put in that kind of time or wait for that kind of lull or allow themselves a moment of boredom in conversations today. Before that happens, they go to a phone. So you can see a kind of perfect storm building up here. All roads led me to a crisis in a certain kind of conversation. It's not like we're not talking. I'm talking about the kind of conversation that's spontaneous, open-ended, where there are tangents, where you allow yourself lulls, where you don't interrupt each other, where there's eye contact, the kind of thing where empathy is born, where creativity is most likely to happen. And a crisis in empathy is happening, and I'm arguing the conversation is the talking cure. Conversation, that kind of conversation, is the most human and humanizing thing that we know how to do. That doesn't take away in the slightest from the fun and the intellectual qualities and the sexiness and the eroticism and the joy of texting and email and messaging and everything, I mean, just everything. It just means that conversation has some particularities, even in our neurophysiology, that makes it the ideal thing for teaching empathy and for getting certain kinds of results in creativity, collaboration, and developing the human. It's the training ground for empathy. And I'm not saying to put away your phones for a certain amount of time because it's polite or because I want you to learn some kind of art of conversation to be kind of fancy talkers. I'm really saying that this flight from conversation, the fact that we don't want to 
sit around for the boring bits, as one woman said to me, I don't like the boring bits, is actually interfering with something we need to do for each other as human beings. You know, and there are, there are great ironies, as I said, even though the psychologists are agreeing on this crisis in empathy, there's this big movement to create these empathy apps. This is getting ourselves into trouble and wanting technology to cure it. Just as people are intolerant of being alone and want technology to cure that. I'm, you, many of you may have heard of a study that's become widely cited in which a group of college students, this was part of a, a group of 21 studies, but in this one study uh, at the University of Virginia, a group of college students were asked, um, they were told that they were going to be asked to sit alone from six to 15 minutes, and were they okay with that? Sure. No devices, no books, sure. Um, did they think they might want to give themselves electroshocks during that period? <laughs> no, not really. Uh, no. They were asked to test the shocking. They, they tested it. There was no, really not. Um, and then they were just asked to sit alone without a device. After six minutes, the students were shocking themselves. So being alone was so intolerable that they would rather give themselves electroshocks than sit quietly with their own thoughts. Being alone is a problem that we want technology to solve. And I bring this up because there is actually an important connection that I want to leave you with between, it's like if you leave with one thing, it's sort of like this is the thing to leave with. This important connection between conversation and solitude. Because I think this is where my work is often misunderstood. They'll say, well, sure, Sherry Turkle says it's a problem if we're looking at our devices when we're together. OK, grant her that. That's not so cool. But what about if I look at my device when I'm alone? Who's that bothering? What is that? That's not a problem for anybody. You need to have a capacity for solitude in order to have a capacity for sociality. The, the link between conversation and solitude is tremendous. We cannot solve our flight from conversation, our crisis of empathy, without dealing with our incapacity for solitude, with our sight, with our flight for, from solitude. That it's only when you can gather yourself, be content with yourself, and because of that, talk to another person and really see who they are as a person and hear them for who they are because you're okay with yourself, can you begin to have a conversation? The way psychologists have put this so beautifully is that if you don't teach your children to be alone, they'll only know how to be lonely. That solitude and sociality go together. And that's why you can't just say, oh, well, you know, the devices, you know, I'll worry about the devices when I'm with other people, but whatever I do by myself, my intolerance for having a moment alone, that's nothing. We have to be more intentional in our use of devices for ourselves, not just because we're breaking up conversations with other people. So what I'm basically saying is that we're at a kind of Rachel Carson moment distracted at our dinner tables and living rooms, at business meetings and in classrooms. Uh, I see traces of a new silent spring. That's the term that Carson coined when we were ready to see that with technological change had come an assault on our environment. And now we've arrived at another moment of recognition. I think people, you know, when I wrote Alone Together, people thought it was a good book, but people wanted to fight with me. I mean, it was like, okay, that's a really good book. Let's fight about this. And, and now I really feel that we've arrived at a moment of recognition when people feel that something is amiss. Something is amiss. We have a great technology, but something is amiss. We need to get it more aligned with the lives we want to leave. This time, technology is implicated in an assault on empathy. Rachel Carson's moment was a moment of recognition that we were at a point where we had to do something and we could do something. And now, too, we can do something. We can do many somethings, many somethings, both in how we design technology. I'm delighted to be speaking here, delighted to be here, and 
how we use technology. There are many something. So I'm just going to quickly rush through a couple of these little somethings so as not to take too much more than seven minutes on all the things to do. And then I hope that in the questions we can open up to more somethings. These somethings sound like little somethings, but when you add them together, it's a change in culture. We're not looking for solutions. We're looking for first steps. So what are some first steps? First of all, act with intention. A father is giving his two-year-old daughter a bath, and he's, on, he's, he's doing his mail with, on the iPhone. And he says to me, I remember giving my 11-year-old daughter a bath when she was two. And he used to just sit with her and talk to her and sing to her and play, the little, play with the little toy she had in her bathtub. I kind of miss that, but with my two-year-old, I play. Uh, I, I, I don't do that. I just do my mail on my iPhone. Technology makes us forget what we know about life. That's author's choice. That's my, fir that's my favorite line in my book. Technology makes us forget what we know about life. He knows that he is doing something that's not, that's a miss. That little girl needs some conversation from her dad. And he enjoyed and was nurtured himself by talking to his older child. At a moment like this, pull up your socks, pull, your, pull yourself together and put down the phone. So act with intention. Participate however you can in a revitalization of public conversation. Um, because public conversations teach us, they model how conversation can unfold. Too many of my students say they don't know how to have a public conversation. They don't know how to have a conversation. Their families, they say their families didn't talk at dinner. I lay a lot of this on parents. It was my generation that thought we would only get a Dick Tracy two-way wrist radio. That was like the best we would ever get. And then all of a sudden I have a smartphone and like, this is like amazing. And we didn't talk to our kids. It's parents who didn't talk at breakfast and dinner. It's kids who are telling me that, they're, that they never took a walk with their father to the corner store when the father didn't have his phone with them. So it's very important that we have public conversations, including classrooms, where there's a lot of talk, which is part of my problem with putting everything on screens and distance learning. Not that it itself isn't good, but you have to worry every time you take conversation away from the classroom. Remember that the presence of a device already signals that your attention is divided, even if you do not intend it to be. So remember those studies of phones on the table. Remember that when you put that phone on the table, you are signaling that you could be elsewhere, even if you don't mean to go elsewhere. So do the simplest thing, just don't put it on the table. Accept what research has made clear. And you've heard this so many times, it's so boring. Anyway, just listen to me. Unitasking is the next big thing. There is no such thing as multitasking. Do one thing at a time. Really, be in the vanguard. It, it, it is, everybody knows this. Nobody wants to hear it, so I've said it. You know it's true. Conversation is the human way to practice unitasking. It's part of the reason it's um, why it's so hard. Don't try to be perfect. My students come to me and they say they do not want to go to office hours. They want to write me an email instead of office hours. Why do they want to write me an email? Because they will write the email that best expresses their question, and I will write them an email back that perfectly answers their, you know, that's perfectly pitched and gives them the most information back. It's a transaction, and it's perfect. Who developed a love of knowledge, a love of learning? Am I here today because I asked a perfect question and somebody gave me a perfect answer? No. There is no one who developed a love of learning for that reason. It's because somebody sat down with me, believed in me, because I looked at somebody in a conversation and said, I could be like that person. I could be. What would it take for me to be like that person? And that person is talking to me and interested in me. That's how it happens. Cultivate solitude. The capacity to be alone with your thoughts is crucial. 
Some of the most crucial conversations you're going to have are conversations with yourself. To have them, you have to learn to listen with your own voice, set aside your laptops and your tablets, and put away your phone. And finally, obey the seven-minute rule. That's the rule suggested to me by a college junior that says that it takes at least seven minutes to see how a conversation is going to unfold. You have to let it unfold and not go to your phone before those minutes pass. If there is a lull in the conversation, let it be. Every technology challenges our human values, which is a good thing because it causes us to reflect on what these values are. If we've invented a technology that causes us to look at each other less, to make less eye contact, that needs to be a signal to us. And the message of my book is that we're all in this together. Let's just look up, look at each other, and start the conversation. Thank you very much. So questions? Yes. Uh, previous generations have, or last generation anyway, um, tended to use television when they didn't want to be alone, that kind of sense of, you know, breaking the loneliness. And from what, what I understand from recent studies, the use of television that way is decreasing to some degree as people are spending more time either online or potentially online with some sort of chat. Do you think that this decrease in empathy that people actually got, saw modeled conversation, modeled empathy in TV, and that the decrease in TV is potentially a bad thing, as weird as that sounds? I mean, how, how do you compare TV as a form of using that? Well, I think TV is that, let me just say a word about TV. Yeah. I, in, in Reclaiming Conversation, I talk a lot about TV, because TV, we've all experienced TV, and it's very important not to get into, oh, well, we're talking about the latest technology, and then we're just, in, we're just upset about this one because of the one we have now, and then we, we were upset about TV when that was the thing. What, what is the reason I'm on, I was a big, I don't want to say computer diva because that would be a little much, but I was on the cover, of, believe it or not, I was on the cover of Wired magazine for being a kind of booster of this tech, this seems like very early days, but in fact it was true that I was very an enthusiast and the difference between, so before I answer your question, what this device has that other devices don't, TV, anything, the uniqueness of this device is the always on, always on you property where you can, every interaction you're in, like your baby, being with your baby, there are, there are potty trainers that have a slot for the iPad. There are baby bouncers with a slot for the iPad. There are, and, and, and to me, those signify our kind of willingness to interrupt every time that normally we would be thinking of the human gaze and the human talk to a baby, which is built into us as what the baby needs, as potentially broken by a screen. So the, the, the fact of those objects in the culture are symptoms of the fact that we have so gotten so used to this always on, always on use situation. A television, I grew up with a television. My family sat around it and we all talked to the television. There was this program, I Remember Mama, on the television about an immigrant family and we all fought with the television about what that family did and how our family would have done it differently and, and how they're making big mistakes and what they're doing with their money. Television didn't have to be isolating. It could be isolating. We have to find a way to make our current technologies less isolating. I mean, it's kind of like a, so television is a perfect example for me of how it's not the object, it's the designing for vulnerability around the object. We are vulnerable to certain kinds of uses of our phones that are not really nurturing of us as, a, as individuals and a collective. And we have to design around that vulnerability to make that relationship better. I mean, that's how I see it. 
But I don't know about television modeling empathy and now our troubles with empathy. I have to think about that. <laughs> That's a, I'll get back to you. We'll, we'll talk more about that. The idea that not enough television is the root of this is something I, I, I have to admit, that's a, that's a toughie. Um, your work is um, on the level of sort of peer interaction and it's very fascinating and frightening to me both. Um, I wanted to ask you about two areas that are related but are on a kind of a different scale. Um, 20 years ago, Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone about the decline of civic participation in society. Um, he wrote that between 1995 and 2000. He was looking back to 1950. Um, he's talking about the decline of voting, of civic organizations, even things like bowling leagues, hence the title of the book. And there clearly there are a lot of things that play into this, including you know residential mobility and all kinds of stuff. But he did, in fact, link it to technology uh, notably TV, the rise of TV, and later the internet over that whole period. I'm just wondering, I know you didn't directly study, you know, things like uh, wider organizations, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about whether this yes. might be related to that. That's number one. And um, number two, um, a, a slightly different sort of thing. I wonder if you have any thoughts about whether this kind of trend is in any way related to the recent in, uh, huge increase in diagnosis of autism and autistic disorders? Well, let me take the second first. I'm not an autism expert, so I, 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 I say this kind of bracketed with that disclaimer. But I know for a fact that in the schools that I was studying that were not schools, specifically not schools for children who had developmental disorders or autism or were on the spectrum. Children were not looking at each other in the eye, were having conversations with their heads down, did not show empathy towards the other child, other children. In one case I report in the book, again, in a school that is not for children on the spectrum, a child, one child's father had committed suicide and another girl says to him, I hope you go the way of your dad. When she didn't lot when she wanted to talk to his sister more in the lunchroom and, you know, out, honestly, a 13-year-old fight. And when the headmaster tries to talk to her about this, I mean, he said to me, his goal was to make that girl cry. You know, that was, <laughs> and then he had to call to his, her mother to explain why she came home in tears. I mean, you know, to try to get her head into the head of this other kid, he said it was almost impossible. In other words, you have children acting as though they were on the spectrum. And in the, the, in the camps where um, children go and have a summer without phones, one of the things the counselors note is the children come in kind of heads down, not talking, having a very hard time relating to other kids, and by the end of the summer, it's often, it's often as long as a 10-week or 12-week session, um, they, they, they're better. So I, I fear that we're misdiagnosing us kids who really have a different kind of disorder, which is that they, they're, they're out of a kind of practice. And I mean this quite literally. They're out of a kind of practice of of, of needing to deal with the complexities of a conversation. And we're diagnosing them perhaps as on the spectrum when really they need the talking cure. Because um, I'll tell you what, just one piece of this, children don't apologize. They, say, they type I'm sorry and they hit send. And the elements of an apology, which is looking you in the eye seeing that you are hurt. You're seeing that I'm upset that I see that you're hurt. You feeling compassionate because you see that I'm upset. My seeing, oh my God, he looks compassionate. Maybe there's a chance for me. And you're seeing that I want to take that chance. This is a very, very complicated dance. And this is how empathy is born. We're doing 
all of this putting each other in the, uh, in the turn of the other, I'm sorry, uh, and hitting send does none of this work. So I'm saying that I see a lot, I have a lot of optimism in just giving kids more of an opportunity. And this is where I want to get back to Robert Putnam. When you're not sending a kid out on the street, when, you, when he's not part of that Boy Scout troop or that after school thing or that little league or that, you know, I, I recently had a, a reunion. One lovely thing about getting your book reviews in New York Times is you, all of a sudden you're meeting people you went to kindergarten with, you know, because they, I mean, it's like, you know, they, oh my God, Sherry, you know, I can go to your book to a signing, you know, I went to kindergarten with you. So I've been mean, having like all these wonderful reunions and we're all talking about how much time we spent on the street. This is in Brooklyn, we spent a lot of this is pre bowling alone. We bowled together. I mean, we didn't bowl. We played other games, but hopscotch or you know, tag, or we were on the street. And all of those interactions were part of communities where people were constantly negotiating, where kids were constantly learning these skills. So I see my work as the human side, the micro side, the personal side, the opening up the door of the, how, the home side of what Robert Putnam is talking about. So I, f I feel very close to the work of, of, of Putnam and other people like him who were talking about the macro, whereas my work <coughs> excuse me, focuses more on the micro. Yeah. Uh, good morning. The, um, I, I love what technology is doing in schools right now for the most part in terms of enabling collaboration between students and, and things like that. Uh, but it's the same. It's the same a lot of the same opportunities for avoidance and um, being alone are created with the screens. So talk a little bit about what you think schools might need to do or could do to help uh, mitigate against, you know, pushing us faster down the path you're talking about, number one. And number two, have you heard from maybe corporations at all uh, around the training implications for this for communications, particularly in a selling environment? Um, you know, go to a sales, I, I, I'm a sales leader here. Um, everyone has a device or two or three at every meeting you go to. So from what you've described, that means that automatically empathy is gone from the meeting and empathy is a key part for in, in salesmanship. So if you could talk about that for a minute too. Well, let me start with that. There's a, there's a great chapter in my book on business. and. <laughs> And my favorite, my favorite story is, um, is a is a guy who says, I cannot make, you know, I cannot close the deal unless I have a conversation, and I have to get, and I cannot tell you how many times he tells me that I will send out an email, and and uh, they, they'll want to send me an email back, and I know that I need to see this person. I need to have his device away for me to close this deal. And, and I have to work so hard to get him at least on the phone or hopefully face to face to really make the money I need. Or people talk at length about people who do not, who just want to send emails back and forth instead of really closing, you know, instead of really dealing with a problem or who will not put their, or the struggle to get the highest levels to put their devices away during very important meetings. And I'm seeing a big shift in willingness to start to force people to put their devices away because really to get things done, you, you, you need full attention. So I think we're just at the cusp. I mean, I, I want this project to be part of, you know, not, no one book changes people's, I mean, I don't expect you guys to read this book and say, oh, you know, now my mind has changed completely. But I want this to, I, I think I've assembled a lot of data that should start a good conversation about phones and business. I know in my work setting, five years ago, professors were, I am not anybody's nanny. I don't want to be anybody's nanny. You come to class, you do whatever you want. I'm nobody's nanny. And now, with all the new data that is in about how one open laptop not only destroys the attention of the person with the open laptop, but a kind of circle around that person, 
we have baskets and we say put put the phone and put the laptop in the basket and then come into class. P professors are now have a totally different attitude about this. There's a story in the book about Carol Steiker at the Harvard Business School who five years ago, six years ago, had everybody, you know, taking notes on laptops. She thought that was the way. Okay, sure, everybody, that's how people write. And then she says that she found that when they had their laptops open, people were transcribing the class. They weren't integrating what was happening in the class. They were doing a trial, like they were court stenographers in her law school class at Harvard. So, and then one day, one of the students was sick. She was in the hospital and different members of the class had offered to take notes for this sick girl. And a student comes up to her and says, Professor Seiker, I, I need to have your notes today because my, my, my power was lost. I didn't have a power cord. And she said, well, why didn't you take notes by hand? And she said, well, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't get it all down if I took notes by hand. So the whole thing that she wants her students to do, which is to integrate, which is to integrate what you hear and, and make sense of it for you, which you can do by hand. This student had, was not even like on the program that she would even think of doing that. All she knows how to do is take everything down on a laptop. And that's the day that Steiker said, no more computers in class. So to your point about schools, I go into classrooms and students are just using these devices in ways that are fantastic, mind blowing. And oh, there's a lot of use of these computers in ways that are mind deadening. And now it's our job to sort this through. And it's, it's a big job because I have, there are some of the most hysterical stories in my book, I think, are students who print out their reading assignments because it's too distracting to read them on the computer that their school gave them because they're too, they're too tempted to look at other things and let their minds wander. So that's what you don't want. So you have to, it's not enough to just put the computers in class, you have to be now, it's the second generation, we all have to like get very vigilant about what about the, the culture of the classroom that we use them in. And I really think schools should not close their libraries. Very, very bad choice. Very bad choice. Putting everything on the machine and thinking libraries are gone. Very bad choice. Is that my phone? <laughs> <laughs> my daughter, who works for LinkedIn, God telling me something, She's 24, she works for LinkedIn, says that only someone over 40 ever forgets to turn over their phone, off their phone. That's very funny. Yes. Hi. Uh, how do you deal with the idea that more and more time being spent on devices is being used to be more productive, be it emails or reading articles, or because the internet has so much information. So all the additional time that is being used to spend on devices is being used to be more productive, and anything, any time that is spent in solitude is sort of wasted time, or so to speak. Well, I honor your question. <laughs> and how can I say in the nicest possible way the premise is wrong? The premise that time in solitude reading email is without any further qualifier, product, the most productive way you could be spending your time is part of what we have to examine because it turns out not to be true. And the premise that time in solitude, getting more information online is the most productive way to be spending your time instead of, for example, and it may sound crazy to you, but it's, it's by hearing something that sounds crazy that you kind of say, oh, let me think about this crazy thing and uh, let me entertain this idea. Mind wandering, letting your imagination wander. We're terrified of that idea. People like, oh, I, I want to stay with my computer. I want to stay on my machine. I mean, we now have a device that lets us do that and lets us feel that we're always productive. That's why we want to be at it. I mean, we wouldn't be in this, pro we wouldn't be having this problem if this thing didn't seduce us with the promise that we're more productive when we're at it. So that's why I, you know, I'm, I'm so sympathetic with your premise because that's how we feel 
when we're with it. I sometimes say it makes us three promises like gifts of a benevolent fairy. You will always be productive. You will always be, you can go where, you can let your imagination go wherever it wants to go. You will always be her. You will never be bored. And you know, and now you'll always be productive. You'll, always, you'll never be wasting time. You'll never, it just turns out that, that, that we've sort of, um, it's like multitasking. The great studies of, of multitasking by, by Clifford Nass, who tragically died a few years ago, showed that when people multitask, they feel like they're doing better and better and better and better for every task they add, when in fact they're doing worse and worse. Every task they add, they feel they're doing better at every task, and in fact they're doing worse at every task. And we, we have to force ourselves to reconsider that that extra time at our email is, is, is not time that's really the most productive and the most collaborative. That's why I do uh, case studies of companies where instead of allowing for um, conversation and collaboration, the, the value of the company is to keep everybody at their screen and they're losing out even though they're stating that really what they want is people talking and collaborating because the pressure to stay at your screen is such an important part of the company culture. So that, when somebody asked about, do I want to have an impact on businesses? I mean, if I had one impact on business, that would be the conversation I would want to start, I think. Yeah. Hi, um, I was curious about when you were talking about kind of resilience of that just a bit of time away helps rebuild that empathy. Um, and it's particularly interesting to me because I keep Shabbat. So from Friday afternoon till Saturday night, my phone is off. No exceptions, no computer, no nothing. And the community of people that I'm friends with and that I spend that time with also have their phones off. And I enjoy it. Um, and I'm curious if there's been any studies either examining the effect within that sort of community, but also I would imagine that that information would be very useful applying outwards of what sort of techniques are useful and how much time away has an effect on empathy and community. Well, actually, there's a, there's a, there's a large community of people who are um, working on the notion of sort of uh, a digital Shabbat and who have kind of... Um, but not necessarily making it a religious practice, right. but sort of using that experience. And, and many people find that it, the 24 hours turns out to be almost ideal, an ideal time. Others, others find that taking three hours a night is perfect. Others find that, so what people have, what people have shown is that is that there are many ways to do it, and that what makes most sense for the beginning is for people to tune it to their, you know, own family lives and their own, you know, kind of, you know, stories. But certainly the one day once a week is ideal. Many families take a one and a half day vacation where they sort of literally go to a different place where there's no internet. Mm -hmm. uh, where they do things together. The, the, the part in, in, in the studies that were done, I'm forgetting the name of the company, it's a, it's a large consulting company, it's public information, it'll come back to me. I write about it. They, they did something called predictable time off, mm -hmm. where they gave people only one night a week. But what you mentioned was very important. You're in a community of people that talks about it. And they didn't only give people one night a week where they said, you don't have to be on your phone. But they had people talk about that experience when they came to work, and they gave them support at work, more support perhaps than other workers had about the stresses of the always-on life. Mm -hmm. And many people think that what is helpful about the Shabbat is that so many people who are taking that Shabbat, they're not just taking that Shabbat, but they're taking that Shabbat, and they're also in community with other people, which is why it makes it harder to study your experience and make it seem like, oh, well, we'll just apply this to everybody and that will be sure. the right recipe for digital detox. Because you're having a combination of no digital, but then an extraordinary group experience. 
But I think people are trying different things. It makes sense, you know, different people in different ways. Yeah, thank you. I, I like your term seduction. Um, it's very easy to get on and stay on, even though there's no reason to, um, to, um, uh, to say, well, it's the easy thing to do, just to stay on here. Uh, my question, I guess, is, is there some way to use these tools more intentionally, as you say? Facebook, for example. My kindergarten friends, sometimes I do see them on Facebook. I say, wow, you know, I had no idea you were in California. You know, what have you been doing for the last 50 years? <laughs> um, or more, actually. But um, so, you know, but I, on the other hand, uh, realizing that I've just spent an hour on Facebook, I said, what the hell have I been doing, right? Is there some way to use tools like that more effectively, more intentionally? Yes, but I'm not sure that um, it, but, but no, again, what is your intention? I think, I think we have to figure out if, is it, I now have an intention that I actually like from, I've learned from this tour that I actually like um, connecting with the people I knew when I was a kid in Brooklyn. So when I'm on Facebook now, I'm not wandering the plains of Facebook just hoping that somebody will like me. I actually kind of like, you know, if I spend some time there, I actually feel motivated to look for the people who were on the masthead of the Lincoln Log at mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn. I don't feel that that's, I, think, I feel that's joyful and positive time online. So that, that's behavior with intention. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is behavior with intention. When you're on the internet with behavior with intention, what's, what's not to like? It's, I mean, when, when, if students in our classes actually looked up something that was crucial to the discussion, brought it to the class and said, my God, you know, here's the thing that's, that's crucial to the discussion, and then that was the end of it, that would be fine. But that's not what happens. They, they look it up, and then they, get, they see a message, and they go, they, they, as one of my students says, I can't bear not to see who wants me when she sees a message from Facebook. And that's what it's about. We all want to see who wants us there. So you go to Facebook, and then once you're there, you see an ad, and then we, see, we have the, the trail, and then you're buying REI sportswear. I mean, that's the sort of MIT trail from the, from the, from the factoid to the f who wants me to the, pup to, you know, to the shoes, to the hiking shoes. So I think that the notion of acting with intention is the one that matters, but you have to decide what your intention is for each of these, for each of these things. Thanks. And this is the last question. Okay, um, I was wondering if you've looked at the difference between talking on the phone with people and texting. I've noticed that I used to, if my wife had a conversation on the phone, I overhear part of what she's talking about. You can ask questions about it later, but if someone picks up a phone, looks at it, it's all private. Um, have you looked at the difference between texting and talking? Well, you know, there was a wonderful, I mean, talking about privacy, and uh, there's so much to discuss here, but let me just give you, just refer you to one wonderful piece of writing. A woman, and, and the issue of privacy and texting and what you lose, a woman recently wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about uh, being a mother and the difference between a, being a mother and doing all of her work for her children like this on the phone and the way her mother did work for her by getting on the phone, organizing a birthday party, you know, getting getting stuff, you know, calling up A and S and asking, you know, do they have any children's toys? She says, my children complain that I'm on the phone all the time texting, but really I'm organizing their birthday parties. When my mother was on the phone, I could hear her life. I could hear that she was doing things for me and our family and food and friendships. And that part of the problem with the privacy of what we do on our phones is that we don't see that we're actually doing things for each other. So, I mean, I'm just so moved by your saying I could hear what my wife was sort of doing. So it's very complicated. This whole, this whole, this whole part of how texting takes us away from each other in this other way is just something that people are starting to study now. Well, listen, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Sorry about my phone, my phone etiquette. Thank you very much.